Hello again. As you families and teachers will know, when you work with children, you pick up all their illnesses, don't you? <laughs> so all the children on our bus had very bad colds, and uh, now I've got one as well. Um, I, uh, I came to this church at the age of 20. And uh, it felt for those first years that there was so much to learn. And every week there was something new. Neda, you're translating. I'm doing okay. Okay. Every week there was something new to learn. The Holy Spirit was just revealing things to me all the time. It was wonderful. At this time, I went to visit uh, my family uh, up in Sherwood Forest. And my mum said to me, Steve, I'm going to go and, s and visit an elderly relative who uh, is on her, in her last days. She's very elderly. She's in her 90s. And she's living in a care home. And this was my mum's great aunt Rose. Okay, great aunt Rose. Now, I'd never met great aunt Rose. I didn't know anything about her at all. So I said, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come. I'll come with you. So on the way, I said to my mum, well, well, tell me a bit about great Aunt Rose. She said, well, Steve, she was a very formidable lady. I said, okay, tell me a bit about her. I said, well, she had two marriages. Well, first of all, she, she really, she was, she was, her faith was very strong. She was a very fiery Christian. And... Uh, she married the captain of the local Salvation Army um, church in the village. And then when he sadly passed away, or as they say, got promoted to glory, she married the pastor of the local Pentecostal church. <laughs> My mum said, I think she had a thing about Christian leaders. <laughs> Formidable lady. So, uh, so I got this, began to get this picture of great Aunt Rose, you see. So we turn up at this, at this care home, and you walk in, and some of you will have been to care homes to see relatives and friends. And there we walked into the lounge, and there was a semicircle of mainly old dears, older, older ladies, one or two men. And, you know, most of them are asleep, some of them are slumbering. Um, they're very elderly. They're, they're clearly in their final days. These are people who've, who've had raised families, they've worked all their lives, had businesses, done many, many things. And here they are, they're in their final days. And you can walk in and feel a little bit sad by this sight. You know what I mean? There's something a little bit sad about it. You know, these are people who really are very, very weak very infirm, you know. And lo and behold, there in the corner was great Aunt Rose. And she was sitting there, half asleep, a very small, shriveled lady, uh, certainly not the physical presence that she'd have been when she was much younger, raising two families. So my mum began talking to great Aunt Rose. She came around a little bit and we think, we think she recognized my mum and she was mentioning various relatives. And then she introduced me and I said, hello, great aunt Rose. I said, um, Jean tells me, my mum tells me, that you love Jesus. Well, boom, out from this shriveled up old lady came this spirit oh I love Jesus she said at the top of her voice and began singing this hymn this Wesley hymn 
Oh, the cross of Jesus. And all the other, it, it, it woke up one or two of the other old dears and then went back, back to sleep again. But I was just knocked back. Here was this a very elderly lady whose body was shutting down in her last days. But out from her came this spirit. Wow. She loved Jesus. And we know where she is now, don't we? You see, our spirit is the part of us which is aware of God. Yeah, it's your God aware bit. Have you been aware of Jesus this morning in the worship time? Yes, something happening inside. Your hands went up, you were loving God. Our spirit is made to be alive, pure, active. And it should be, in God's plan, our spirit should be the part of us which is, if you like, leading our body, which is aware of things outside and, and temperature and cold and hunger and getting sick and things. And our soul, which is your, your mind and your emotion, your will, your, if you like, your self-aware bit, our spirit should really be in charge saying, come on, come on, let's, let's worship Jesus. But instead, instead, so often our, the spirit of a person is inactive, sleepy, and in some cases not clean, polluted. And that's because of sin. Yeah? Now, last time I was talking, we were talking about healing. When we did an introduction to healing, we looked at how Jesus forgives sin but then heals the effects of sin. Yeah? And we had a little re response time. Later on, and I know Kev's going to mention it as well, if you want healing for, for anything, healing for your, for your body, I'm going to get some healing prayer later. If, if you need healing for anything in, in your mind, your emotion, or in your spirit, come, come and just ask someone to, to pray for you this morning. Okay. Now, the scripture we're going to look at this morning is from Colossians. I had this in my daily readings a couple of weeks ago, and this, these verses absolutely flew out of the page. You know how that happens sometimes? You're reading something, and they just, they just highlight it, aren't they? <laughs> so, Nick, could we, could we have that first one? Thank you very much. Colossians 2. 13 to 15. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Right, so the first thing to, to mention here is that Paul is saying that we were dead. Well, clearly, he wasn't speaking to people who physically died, was he? <laughs> they were alive, they were reading his letter. So, they were dead in their spirit. They were dead in their relationship to God. And that's what sin does. Sin causes our spirit to become dead. Sin causes death. Sin is the nature that we're born with. It's called original sin. We're born with sin. And sin is also the things that we do as a result of that sinful nature. I remember being very, very young and at times being extremely naughty. But I remember one time I decided that I wanted to cry and to scream. 
Were you like that? Anybody else here like that? Was it only me? Come on, confession time, right? Did you ever cry and scream? Thank you. But I remember thinking, why am I screaming? I'm quite happy today, and I was. I just decided I wanted to scream. (laughs) You understand? There was something inside of me that was determined to express itself. And uh, my mum couldn't understand it either, or my dad. (laughs) It's my sinful nature. Okay. Sin offends God and breaks our relationship with him. Now, let's have a look at this. Verse 14. He, God, cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. That was, that was the verse that most struck me. Well, it all struck me, but this is the verse that really struck me. God deals with the record of our sins by nailing them to a cross. Let's have a look at the background. In Rome at that time, when this letter was being written, a man or a woman who was guilty of a, what, might we, what we might call a normal crime, not a crime that would lead to death, they would be condemned to prison. And on the door of their prison cell would be a paper, a certificate of debt. And it would give the person's name and their crime and how long they had to be in that prison cell to pay off their debt. Get the picture? So outside every single, every single cell, you would see the person's name, their crime, and what they had to pay. And when the sentence was complete, on that piece of paper would be written, paid in full. Paid in full. And that would be registered by the judge. The judge would have his record of the crime and the judge would record on his book, paid in full. Get the picture. And then say, if it was a man, from that moment on in his life, he would carry that bit of paper with him all the time And if someone said, hey, aren't you the guy who committed that terrible crime? You stole something, you you did something really bad. He could say yes. 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 And here's my paper. Paid in full. Oh, okay. What about a crime that was worthy of death? Well, as we know, in Rome, the punishment for a crime worthy of death, capital offence it's called, was the cross. And the certificate of debt with the name and the crime And the punishment would be nailed above the head of the criminal. Just like it was put on the door of the prison cell. So as we know, Pontius Pilate put the death certificate above Jesus, didn't he? This is Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. He was being sarcastic. 
What was his crime? He hadn't committed a crime. He was the only man to have never sinned. There was no crime. The crime was not what he did. The crime was who he was. His crime was being the king. And as Jane was saying, he is the king of heaven, is he not? He is the king of all, the king of eternity, the king of every creature. To proclaim yourself to be the king, an earthly king, was a crime against Caesar. It was a crime worthy of death. But that's not what Jesus said he was. Jesus is the king of heaven. They thought they were crucifying him, killing him for a crime against Caesar. Jesus was dying for our sins against God. So, on that paper, above the head of Jesus, is not his crime, it's my crime. And it's your crime. Your sins are written on the paper above the head of Jesus. And God... The Father has now received that paper. And God the Father has now put it into his book. Paid in full. 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 Is that good? Are you happy? <laughs> Are you happy? Are you sure? Are you happy? Paid in full on the back row. Paid in full out of, out of the lobby. Paid in full. The Father has registered it in heaven. Paid in full. You see, there were at least six things that Jesus was nailing to the cross. I'm going to mention them briefly here. This is probably worth another Sunday morning or two or three, but I'm just going to mention them because these things affect your spirit. In some of your Bibles, perhaps you read the, the, the NIV, when you read this verse 14 here, he cancelled the record of the charges. In your Bible, it may say he cancelled the legal record of the charges. Okay. Andy works in the legal profession. He'll be interested in this word. The legal record, the law. He cancelled the legal record. He cancelled the curse of the law. Now, last week, Julia mentioned about curses. Look, God's law is good. But no person except for Jesus has ever kept the law of God. It has become a curse for us. We can't do it. So any religion, any philosophy, any political ideas, they cannot help you to please God. They cannot help you to, fu to fulfill the law of God. It's a curse. Unless you are with Jesus, you cannot fulfill the law of God. It is impossible. Try as you might. Try and be the best person you can. Go on all the courses that help you be a good person. It's doomed to failure. It's a curse. Ever tried to be a good person? <laughs> yeah, we all try, don't we? But only in Jesus is the curse of the law broken. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right? That curse is broken. That debt is paid. 
And therefore, the feeling of condemnation and not being good enough, that is also broken. Is that good? <laughs> Anybody here ever felt condemned? Anybody here just felt so bad because of their sin? I haven't got four arms. I put four arms up. If you're like me, I'm, I'm my own worst enemy, well, my own worst critic, if you like. I don't need anybody to condemn me. I can do it myself very well. Thank you very much. That's just my nature. You know, I can always spot something that's wrong, but maybe I need others to show me as well. But I tend to put myself down at times. Right. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. You've broken the power of condemnation. It's good to be convicted, isn't it? Convicted of our sin. It's good to know conviction. That's the first step in finding Jesus. Because we're no longer condemned, our old sinful nature now can be taken away. That's what baptism is all about. The old sinful nature. Why was I naughty as a child? Why were you naughty? Why, why are we selfish? Because of something inside of us. And God has an answer. That old sinful nature, your nature, is, is on that bit of paper. It's cut away. Which means that the world no longer has a power over you. Is that right? Once the world had a power over you, let's be honest, it did. It could attract you with all sorts of things. But now you are dead to the world and the world is dead to you. Oh, it can still feel attractive at times, but it's lost its power. You know you're free. If the world has lost its power, so has the devil. It's not till you become a Christian, I believe, when you really realize just how much power and influence the devil has had on your life in the background. The control of the devil is broken on the cross. Is that good? The control of the devil is broken on the cross. That is also on the bit of paper above his head. And finally, the final enemy. What's the final enemy? Can anybody tell me? Death, the final enemy. Death. There is nobody in this room who has not at some point feared death. It's a human thought. It's a human emotion. Even the strongest Christians can think, oh, what's going to happen when I die? Well, I can tell you what, what's going to happen. For those who don't know Jesus, there will be a judgment of sin. And we meet God. For those who know Jesus and have taken Jesus into their heart, their sin is already judged. Hallelujah. Your sin is already judged on the cross. That's what it was. It's there. The record is there. No fear. No fear of judgment of sin. It's there. There will be an account given for what required, for what we have done with the grace of God that we have received. Of course, we know that from the parables. What grace have we received? How much love have we received? What have we done with that grace and love? Have we loved Jesus? Have we served? Have we, as you were saying, have we served people? Yes, we, we, we will give an account. Of course we will. That is what will happen. But the judgment of sin has already taken place. It's here on our record. It's there above the head of Jesus. Wow, what a list. It's no wonder at the very moment when you accept Jesus as your Lord, when you confess your sins and you believe he's died for you, it's no wonder that your spirit comes alive, is it? Fancy living with all that lot. No wonder. It's a massive New birth. 
you know, whether you have a gradual conversion or a very explosive one, dynamic one, at some point, you know your spirit has come alive. It's called new birth. Let's have a look at something from Galatians. Well, we'll just read this at the end of the end of, uh, last scripture. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Yes, whenever the devil tries to have a go at you, just say, go to the cross. Go to the cross. It's all there. Off you go. Galatians 4, 6. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Has it happened? Has it happened for you? Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit sits alongside your spirit. He doesn't mingle with your spirit. He sits alongside your spirit. He brings your spirit to life. Vroom! He's always speaking, inspiring your spirit. So my question to you is, how can we tell if somebody is born again? How can we tell if someone's spirit is alive. Do you want to just spend a couple of minutes talking with the person next to you? How can you tell if someone is born of God? How can you tell if their spirit is alive? Just tell the person next to you. Okay, right. <clears throat> Sounds like you're having a good, good talk. About two months ago, I got invited to a Kurdish restaurant. It's a very good thing to do. Um, it's great food. And I uh, sat there with Harem, who's one of our Kurdish guys, eating a plate full of rice and various other things. And there was a table just across the way, two, two guys there. And as we sat down, I thought, I've got a feeling... I know those two people. Have we ever seen them before? And then we had the meal. I thought, I'm sure I know those, but there's just something about them. And um, at the end of the, bit, uh, the meal, I thought, I've just got to go and say hello, you know. If I make a fool of myself, I make a fool of myself. And uh, had we met before? No. Were they from Coventry? No. They were from Bournemouth. Um, what were they doing? They were two Christians who had come to come and talk at a, at a local church. But there was just a recognition of spirit. We just recognized one another's spirit, life, love, power. So I wonder what, uh, what your answers were. I'm just going to give you Four, four things, four, four ways of recognizing that someone has a spirit that is, that is alive. Number one is you are aware of God. His presence, his voice, his whispers, his love. You're just aware. You're aware of the Holy Spirit. You're aware of what pleases him. You're aware that forgiving people is good. You're aware that telling the truth is good. Your conscience is clear. You're also aware of what is bad. You become aware that pride and self-righteousness hurts people and hurts God. Bitterness affects your spirit. You know, many of us in this room have, have reasons to be angry, have reasons to be hurt. But if we hold on to those things, it will affect our spirit. So 
us in the Bible that bitterness is a very bad thing in the human spirit. For years, I've worked for a Christian business and I've lived in a Christian family community. I now work for a business that is not Christian. And there is lots of swearing and lots of blaspheming. That is using God's name in vain. And at times it shocks me because I'm talking to someone who's really quite friendly, good person, I'm getting along, and suddenly out comes a swear word. And it, it, it knocks me back. <laughs> oh, all right, okay. <laughs> you know, without Jesus, this is normal nature. It is the nature of a fallen person to offend God. And I used to do it before I was saved. And I'm shocked by it now because my spirit is aware that that's, that's not right. Secondly, as we said before, the world no longer has a power over us. It can no longer dominate you. It's very sad when you meet Christians who are still captured by the things of the world, where ambition or selfish ambition, you know, they must get on, they must reach the top of the, the, the tree, they must have money, they must have the best car, they must have status. We're warned against these things in the Bible. When you're born of God, your spirit directs you and says, no, that's not. That's not of me. That's not of the way of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, we love people. It's great when you see someone find Jesus and they just immediately begin to love people. They immediately begin to serve them and we see God's people as our heroes. David says in the Psalms, the godly are my heroes. They're the people I want to follow. I don't want to follow celebrities. I don't, I don't want to follow empty people. Goodness me, who wants to follow anything we read in the papers these days? <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. You know, we want, to, we want to follow the godly, don't we? And finally... Those who have a live spirit have a love for the kingdom. The kingdom is where the Holy Spirit is working, where Jesus is working. We love the kingdom. Can you see the kingdom? Do you love the kingdom? They want to work for God and they make choices, strong choices about their life, their work, where they live, their church. They make choices for the kingdom of God. That is one of the one of the most powerful testimonies, the fact that you have got an alive spirit, you make strong choices for the kingdom of God. I remember that man who was so on fire for God and he chose a selfish way of life. And I met him a few years later and his spirit had shrunk. His spirit was no longer strong. He was no longer clear. He no longer had a great love for Jesus. It was sad, really sad. And I longed for him, prayed for him, to regain his love for Jesus and his alive spirit. Now, loving Jesus and growing in your spirit is, is a lifetime's work, is David and I had a quick chat to the end of last week and he said to me, he said, salvation is in a moment and growing in holiness takes a lifetime. Is that true? That is true, isn't it? That is true. But it's every day. It's every day growing in Jesus, responding to his love, responding to his call. I want you to remember your record is there on the cross above the head of Jesus. Every, everything that keeps you from him has been paid in full. 
So, we're going to finish now. We can, you can come and have prayer for anything you want to. Whether you want to respond to what we've been saying, we want to have prayer for your physical ailments, for anything at all, you can come. I just want to say this, look, it's good to respond to our conscience. Our spirit is alive when our conscience is alive. Respond to your conscience. If you've got any issue with any form of a problem or addiction of any kind, come and get prayer for it. The sin that can be defeated is a forgiven sin. Get, get everything under the blood. And if you feel condemned about anything, look, it's there. Let's, let's confirm. Let's, let's say before Jesus, those sins are paid in full. You may simply want, want to receive more of the Holy Spirit. You may say, yes, I, want, I remember those times when I was really on fire for God. I need the Holy Spirit. Yeah, just, just come and get some prayer if you want to. If, otherwise, we'll just carry on worshipping and uh, thank you, Lord. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, that this room is full of your sons and daughters. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have come and you have taken us to the cross. And the blood of the Lamb has defeated and paid for our sins and taken away the condemnation and taken away all the legal requirements. And now our spirit is alive. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, living God. Lord, will you come and cause our spirits to be healed? Lord, purify our spirits of any bitterness, of any hurts and pains. Lord, come and bring cleansing to our spirits and come and cause us to, to know you and to grow in you day by day. Thank you, living God. Hallelujah. Amen. Bless you.